All right. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michal. I'm a software engineer at Deliveroo. And today I'll be talking about a simple task of uh, rewriting a service. Uh, so let's go. Let's jump into it. So as a first thing, you might ask, why would you want to rewrite a service? So in my experience, the main reason tends to be you want to convert it to a different language. This might be for performance reasons or getting a better resource usage so uh, you can run it on smaller machines or with, uh, for cheaper. Uh, this is especially true if you are going from a very old technology or from a dynamic interpreted language uh, to a statically compiled one. Uh, you might also want to gain uh, compatibility with new technologies and you might want to align uh, with the rest of your tech stack and with the capabilities of your engineering team. Uh, so this talk is uh, based on our experience that we had at Deliveroo rewriting a service around this time last year. And for us, the main reason for uh, rewriting the service was the third reason. So we went from a Scala application to a Go application. And the main reason was that most of our stack is built in Go and we have this odd service that was uh, running in Scala. So we wanted to leverage all the tooling and libraries that we built to support everything else. Uh, and also just kind of uh, gain a bit of benefit of switching to Go by having a smaller uh, resource footprint uh, of the service. I will reference uh, 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 throughout the talk uh, our experience and, and the learnings kind of uh, we got from it. Uh, so now let's say we decided uh, we want to rewrite a service. Uh, let's set some goals of uh, how we want to do about it and what, we, uh, what do we want to achieve uh, doing it. So as a first, for, uh, as a first point, we would want to minimize the risk of causing an incident, uh, breaking our systems, um, taking our production down and you know, uh, losing revenue. Uh, as a second point, we would want to ensure uh, that our changes can be rolled out incrementally, so we don't have a big bang waterfall style of release uh, where, where, where we have high probability of potentially breaking something. And as a third point, we might want to ensure that the new service behaves exactly the same way as the old service. So this was the case for us. Uh, we wanted to create a drop-in replacement for the old service. Uh, the old service was a JSON REST API, so, some, uh, so pretty standard, uh, standard thing. Uh, so let's look at it from an architectural perspective. How would we go and approach this problem? So there's a very famous pattern, first kind of uh, named by Martin Fowler. Uh, it's called the strangler fig pattern. And here's a lovely demonstration uh, using a picture of the strangler fig plant. So uh, you have uh, this tree that is happily living on its own and the strangler fig just goes and attaches itself to the tree and then starts uh, growing first one branch and then slowly strangles the tree, eventually killing it and replacing it as a whole. Uh, so this is uh, what we want to do uh, with our services. So if we were to convert this to an architecture diagram, it will look something like this. I try to look, use colors to kind of uh, reference uh, uh, to match the, the picture of the tree. Uh, so we, here, we, here we have the client calling the legacy API. As a first step, uh, we introduce a proxy that intercepts the requests and the responses uh, from the legacy API. Uh, then as a second step, we start routing some of the requests to a new API. And once we are kind of happy that everything works uh, as we want it to, uh, we can completely switch uh, and just use the new API on its own. Uh, once we've done this, uh, we can get rid of the proxy and just go straight to the, to the new API. Here I, uh, I'll distribute the slides after the talk. I linked to a, to a documentation uh, by Microsoft. Uh, they have on their website a nice collection of different architectural patterns which you can use in the cloud. Uh, so I wanted to give them a shout out and thanks for hosting us uh, today. Uh, so let's look at a concrete example, and this is basically uh, based on what, we, uh, what we've done uh, with our project. So uh, we are replacing a REST API. Uh, uh, we, are, we are setting it up in a way that both the old API and the new API use the same database. So this way we are kind of uh, uh, getting rid of the problem of uh, synchronizing data between two different systems, although we still need to be careful about how, how we go about it. If we have a database that's kind of running uh, at, its, at its capabilities, you, you don't want to overwhelm, overwhelm, overwhelm the database by essentially doubling the traffic uh, that goes to it. Uh, and then finally, uh, given that this is a Go meetup, we want to build the proxy uh, and the new API in Go. Uh, 
I won't go into too much detail about building the API as there's a variety of resources available or about on the web and tutorials how, on how to build uh, REST APIs in, in Go. Yeah, just the one thing I did want to call out was around the, the data stuff. So uh, when you are using a database, you do need to be careful with, uh, with your rights. Uh, you can, because uh, then you can get into a situation where you are doubling the number of rights that you're doing or you have a data race uh, on your data. So uh, if you have uh, the old and new service trying to write at the same time, uh, they might uh, come to a conflict and maybe one fails, uh, uh, one succeeds. Uh, so that's it, so we laid the ground uh, and now let's uh, summarize like how we want to do the rollout. So we chose to do it in a way where we can kind of, uh, when we first introduce the proxy as, as I described before, uh, and then we start routing the request to the both APIs at the same time, still serving the, the data from the old API as the response to the user. But then in the background, we compare the responses and check for differences. And this way we can ensure uh, that the APIs behave the same way and we can capture any sort of edge cases that you want to get uh, with live data. So you would first go and uh, try this in your staging environment. And once you kind of are confident that everything works as expected, you can go and start routing some percentage of your live traffic through this, uh, through this system, um, eventually potentially going all the way to 100% if you want to have a coverage and trust that your new system uh, is behaving in exactly the same way as the old one. And then uh, if we find, do find differences, we'll alert on them, uh, and then this will give us the ability to go and fix them, uh, and then we just repeat the process until we get 100% match. And then when we achieve that and we have a good uh, trust in the system, uh, we can go and deploy it uh, fully. Uh, so let's start uh, <laughs> and build a simple proxy. Uh, so I'll now mostly <clears throat> uh, focus on building the proxy and, and I want to demonstrate uh, what, what tools are available in the standard library that, uh, that can help us do this. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll use very little third party dependencies. So let's go and do that. Uh, but yeah, before we jump into it, I thought I would just go and touch on uh, the HTTP uh, package that we are gonna use and the types that you find in it, uh, just in case there are people who are maybe not as familiar with, with this. Uh, so to implement a server, uh, basically all you need to do is implement this handle interface that's, uh, that only has one method, which is serve HTTP. It takes a request, uh, which has uh, things like the method that uh, the client called the, uh, called the server with, the URL, uh, that was called uh, the headers and the body. The body is a IO read closer, so you can read a slice of bytes uh, from, the, uh, of the, from the body, or you can close the response when you no longer want to read it. Uh, and so this way you get the request, and to, uh, to write a response back to the, uh, back to the caller, uh, you get this uh, response writer interface, and so this has uh, three methods on it, so you can gain access to the headers, so you can go and set the headers and uh, to whatever you want. Then you can write them out and set the status code for your response. And then you write out the body, uh, you write it with bytes. So this is the standard Go writer interface, uh, the, the, the write method. So with that all set, uh, let's jump into it and let's build a simple proxy. So here uh, we are importing the HTTP library and the HTTP util library. We get from the environment uh, URL uh, of the system to which we want to forward, forward our requests. Uh, and then we initialize the server. So we'll be serving on port 3000. So we specify the address uh, where the service will be, server will be listening to. And we provide a handler. So uh, the HTTP util package uh, very helpfully provides this uh, single river proxy uh, HTTP handler that implements the handler interface. And it does what it says on the tin. It just uh, forwards the requests that come in uh, to the provided URL. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things you can configure on uh, on this type, on this on on this structure, but we won't go into too much detail. You can do things like add uh, add more headers or rewrite paths and so on, uh, but it's not needed for 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 this example. And as the last thing, uh, we just run run the server, and this is basically it. We we build the proxy. You just need to call the run function in a in your main function, uh, and maybe use log fatal to to log the error. Uh, so yeah, that's nice and simple, you know, we've done it. Uh, uh, the writers of the Go language uh, implemented this all for us. So let's make things more interesting. So let's start routing the requests uh, to the two different APIs. Uh, so how will, we, how will we go about that? 
So we will first introduce this manage interface. It has a single method uh, that takes the request and, and tell us whether to use the old service or not. Uh, we pass in the request so we can uh, determine based on the path or headers or, or the method uh, whether, to, whether we want to use the, new, uh, the old service or not. Uh, in, a, in a live system, you might, you might base this on some environment variables or some live reloading config. Uh, what we have done is uh, we used our feature flag system to be able to control pair route uh, which endpoint we're using. Uh, and then uh, we implement, uh, we create a new HTTP handler. So what we are doing here, we are essentially replacing the line uh, where we are using the HTTP prox uh, reverse proxy directly, the HTTP util, uh, so the highlighted line. So we're gonna replace it with this function. And so what we do here, we pass in uh, two URLs, one to the old service, one to the new service. We instantiate the, the reverse proxies, and then we return a HTTP handler function. Uh, so what this does is a very clever, very clever way of implementing the HTTP handler interface by just writing a function. Uh, and so uh, what we do in our HTTP handler uh, is just we, we call our manager and figure out whether we should use the old one, uh, the old, old service or the new service. Uh, based on that, uh, we call the appropriate uh, proxy handler. So nice and simple. We have a dynamic way of routing requests to two different services. So let's uh, make things more interesting. Uh, so let's add support for you know, routing, uh, routing the data to the two APIs and then comparing their, their response, res responses. So for that, uh, we each introduce this proxy mode type, uh, which is just an enum of three values that determines uh, whether we just want to go directly to the old system or the new system, or whether we want to do the diffing. Um, and then we amend the manager interface uh, to, you know, uh, to, re to return this proxy mode. And now uh, let's look at how we would uh, change the proxy handler construction. So uh, uh, what we did, we, we have everything as before. We have the two URLs that we take in. Uh, we create the two proxy handlers, and then we create a new diffing handler or the handler that checks for differences. Uh, and we pass in the, the two proxy handlers in. And then our if statement uh, turns into a switch statement where we call the appropriate handler uh, based on the proxy mode that we got. Uh, so yeah, this is all uh, pretty straightforward, uh, but let, let, let's look at the, uh, the diff handler. So this is where most of the, the magic happens. So if, uh, I, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. I'll go through it uh, bit by bit, so don't feel like you need to understand everything that's going on. The first bit we need to do, we need to turn one request into two, because we, we can reuse the same request object uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the two calls, especially if you want to make them concurrently. The problem is the body. We can only read the body once, uh, so we need to go and buffer it. And that's what we do in this get requests to forward function. So we uh, use the IO read all uh, utility function from the standard library to read the complete body. And so we get the slice of bytes. Uh, then we use the request.clone method to clone the request. This performs a shallow clone of the, uh, of the object. And so then we just override the body with, uh, with the bytes that we just, uh, we just read. Uh, here we go to the standard library again. Uh, we get a read implementation by using the byte, bytes package. But we also need a close method. So we uh, use the IO nope closer uh, function uh, from the IO package to to get the close method. The, the close method doesn't do anything in this case because there's nothing to close. Uh, so we do that for both the uh, request that goes to the old, uh, uh, old system and the request that goes to the new system. Uh, here, the one difference is the context which we are passing in. Uh, since the going to the old system is still our main path, uh, we pass it the context from the incoming request. Uh, for the new, uh, new re request to the new system, uh, I just use context background here. In a production system, you would want to set uh, set some timeout for this uh, for this for this for this context. So yeah, so that's if we come back. So now we uh, now we got the two requests. Now we also want to re record the responses. So what I do here, I use the HTTP test uh, response recorder. You know, you might uh, have alarm bells going on. There's a HTTP test package, but it's uh, it's actually quite uh, quite innocent. So. The, what the HTTP test package provides you is a uh, response, 
response writer implementation. It's, it's a struct uh, that implements the interface. It's pretty simple, it's a pretty straightforward. Uh, you might, you can kind of implement the same code uh, yourself if you want to maybe simplify some things. But it's, a, it's very simple. It's intended to use for tests, but there's nothing that will stop you to using it in, in production. So it will record the, the data that um, your handlers write, and then you can use it from there. And so, so that, that covers the first half of the function. So the second, bit, second thing that we do is uh, we create a wait group. So we want to wait for the two response, uh, for the two HTTP call that go out to finish before we start checking for differences. So we don't have a data race. Uh, so we create the wait group. That's another uh, primitive from the standard library. Uh, we increment its value to two because we are waiting for two requests to complete. And then we uh, call this diff responses function to which we pass the wait group and the two response recorders. So that's the captured responses from the two APIs. Uh, and then we fire out the go routine uh, that goes and, and calls the, the new service and we call done in the defer statement so that we can always ensure that we decrease the counter uh, in the wait group. And finally, we just, we do the same for the, for the old servers, but we do it in the, in the main Go routine that we are in. Uh, so we call the further done, and we call the old service handler. And one final thing we need to do, because we recorded the response, but we haven't uh, written it back to the client, so we need to copy it over. Uh, so to do that, that's very straightforward. Uh, we just first iterate over all the headers. Uh, we add those to the response, and then we write out the headers and set the status code for the response. And finally, we write out all of the body. So that's it. Uh, oh, wow. sorry. Uh, uh, too many, uh, too much hand waving. Uh, so yes, that's we we wrote uh, wrote all of the response. Uh, so now let's uh, let's look at the last bit that we haven't seen, and this is uh, checking for the differences. So as I said, the first thing that we do, uh, we just wait for both of the both of the calls to the underlying services to complete. Uh, then, uh, once they did complete, we should have the response objects populated. So we can start comparing them. Uh, so first, I compare the status code, uh, whether that's correct, whether that matches or not. If it doesn't match, uh, I just print uh, uh, print that it doesn't match. Then I can go and compare all of the headers that I got back, because uh, you know headers are also part of the response. So you would want to check that they match too. Uh, and then. Uh, I'm doing this funny thing uh, with the JSON package. So we have a JSON REST API, and in Go, when you use the when when you try to unmarshal JSON data into into a variable of type any, Go will still try to try to build up the JSON response, but it will only use the standard uh, uh, the built-in types. So a JSON object will become a map from string to a to a type of any or empty interface, and I'm doing this because you know, otherwise we would just have to compare slice of bytes or we can convert them to strings, but it's you know, uh, quite hard to figure out what's, what's going wrong there, what's, why, the, why the responses don't match. So you want to kind of low, <clears throat> go deeper and kind of find out which, uh, which part of the response uh, differ. So, uh, so we unmarshal the responses in this way and then we go and compare them. So you, can, you, you, can, you probably spotted that I'm using this cmp.diff package. That's the Google compare package. This is another bit that's not designed to be used in production, and this one has some, some bigger flaws than the standard library recorder. Uh, so the problem here is that it's, uh, given that it's not designed to be used in production, its performance is, is not optimal, and it can also panic uh, if it doesn't know how to compare the two types. Uh, however, if you are kind of careful, you can, you can get around it and, and use, this, uh, use this tool as well. It's quite good, and it's, it's kind of intended to to be a better version of your reflect uh, db equal uh, function. It gives you a better different, nicer differences uh, to look at. Uh, so if you handle the panics, uh, so if you handle your panics properly, and if you give your proxy enough resources, uh, enough CPU resources, then you, you, <clears throat> you should be all right. Or if you just, if you only diff on a sufficiently small amount of your traffic. Alternatively, you can go and hand write the uh, equal methods, that's usually the fastest way to go. Or you can use the tools such as go derive, uh, where you can, uh, where you, you tell the tool to go and generate, you, generate your equal methods. However, in this case, you then have to come up with a logic to, 
uh, to compare the two responses uh, and to, to do the unmarshalling for you. So ba based on the route, you would need to unmarshal to the correct struct and you would need to be careful not to lose information because when you unmarshal to a struct, any unknown fields will be discarded. Uh, so you might want to have some additional checks apart from just uh, doing this unmarshalling. Doing it the way I presented, it kind of captures any, any differences. And so yeah, that's basically it. Uh, we build the whole system, we can diff, and we can run as, as, as I described at the beginning. Uh, in a production setup, you would want to use a, you'd want to do a couple of additional steps. You would, instead of just printing stuff out, as I did in the last uh, slide, uh, you would want to uh, keep met, uh, introduce metrics, uh, as well as logging, or maybe you can use uh, alerting systems such as Hentry to capture your differences. Uh, if you're using traces in your system, you'd want to ensure that tracing is correctly propagated in all of the system. You would want to configure panic handling and other stuff that I already mentioned um, and, and, and do some other optimizations. If you want to look at this code and the kind of almost production ready version of the, of the code I presented that's available in this GitHub repository, it is basically extracted the code that we used when we did our, trans uh, our transition. However, that code was kind of littered with our references to our flare a feature flag system and our tracing, and and there was other, there was other stuff that I kind of wanted to clean up uh, that I didn't have time to when we're doing the actual rewrite. But uh, uh, functionally, it's the same. Uh, so yeah, it's it's not it's not quite finished. So yeah, <laughs> don't judge it too much, but it should give you an idea what what you can do. And so, how did this approach work for us? So it worked pretty well because otherwise I wouldn't be here shouting about it. Uh, so we managed to reach 100% match across all of our read endpoints. So we basically, with this approach, we first introduced the proxy and then we uh, started implementing endpoints one by one. So once we had one endpoint, we can start route traffic through the through that endpoint, start comparing and fixing differences while also implementing the other endpoints. Uh, so we can work on multiple, multiple things at the same time. And with the iterative approach that I described earlier, yeah, we eventually managed to read the 100% matching we did uh, manage to complete it more or less in time that we allocated, uh, which doesn't apparently happen that often. Uh, and also we didn't really cause any major issues, so that was, that was good. We did, uh, however, uh, did one thing slightly differently uh, than how I described here. We implemented our new API using gRPC, and we used the proxy to do the translation from a HTTP request, REST request uh, to, uh, to gRPC request to, to our new API. And this demonstrates the flexibility of the, of the approach. Uh, so you, you can do all sorts of things like this as well. So you, can, you don't even have to have a proxy and a new API as two different services. It can actually be one service uh, and you just uh, implement your HTTP handler as a new service and then instead of using the proxy, uh, the reverse proxy there or any, anything else really. And, uh, merging the two will kind of save you having to do the step of removing the proxy at the end. Uh, this little graph uh, that I haven't touched on is just an example for, of one of our endpoints when we, um, when we are running things in, I think it's an actual graph from our production. I can tell you how much data is going through, uh, but uh, the yellow line uh, is the number of total requests, the purple line is the number of uh, matching requests, and the blue line is the number of differing requests, and you can see that, you know, just before 4 p.m. we did something that uh, fixed issues and so our differences dropped. And this was the process we are looking at the metrics, looking at examples, you know, finding the most common uh, uh, causes of issues, fixing them uh, and, and going on through the process. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Uh, hope you enjoy the talk and if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. These are uh, all the links you can reach me at. Sorry. <clears throat> Thanks for the good presentation. Yeah. All good? <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering how did you um, compare the results like in, in the diff handler for the write requests without ending up with duplicate data, and if you tested the side effects as well, not just the output. That, that, that's the bit that we didn't do. You can, you can simulate it by maybe 
So if you have, let's say, a SQL database, you just you simulate the transactions, but then you don't commit them. But then you need to be kind of careful to to, to not do it, or you can you write you you write you send your writes to a slightly to a different database than than your reads. You, you can you can duplicate it maybe that way. But we 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 didn't really go that way. We just kind of ensured that you know uh, we can try to set up. Uh, uh, Creates do writes uh, through the new new database and then check that they they show up correctly on on the read side. But yeah, that that's the much much more complicated bit that I didn't really go into. But we we kind of just said like okay, if writes break, we will hear about it uh, like much more quickly than maybe if the <laughs> if if the reads if the reads break. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you What is, okay. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Katerina. Um, I was just wondering, uh, you were explaining, explaining the fig pattern. So what made you choose that way of migrating the servers? Or is this like the way you knew or like there was other options to do it? And also if what were like the factors that impacted your choice, so for example, what was your amount like knowledge on the previous legacy system? Like, was it like, were you familiar with it or not so much? Yeah. yeah so the reason for choosing the strangulific pattern is like generally one of the recommended approaches to use uh, to use in this case. Uh, I'm not quite sure we deliberated uh, other options. You can always just do a big redo your API and just start using it uh, straight away, but you know, we didn't want to use it. And we kind of wanted to re replace the functionality as we went along. And then if you want to do it that way, you kind of don't really have many more options to, apart from kind of still uh, relying on the, on the old system, unless you want to go and then rewrite all of your clients to, uh, to change the logic in them. And so what uh, was then about another part of the question? If you had a lot of knowledge on the previous ah, yeah. legacy uh, no. API, or or not at all? Yeah, no, we we, we did have a, you know a, it wasn't a black box, so we, we could see the code, we can understand the code. Uh, uh, that was fine, but uh, it wasn't it wasn't the easiest system to get, get your head around it. And sometimes, if, even if you have a perfect understanding of of, a, of an existing system, it might be hard to kind of recreate it in, in a different language uh, perfectly. So you can always make mistakes and people all make mistakes. And in, in, in this case, we wanted to be sure that uh, our, uh, our, the new system behaves exactly the same way. It's kind of a, almost a, a business critical thing. So we, uh, that's why we chose this approach of uh, checking for differences on the read side, because the read side was the critical part uh, uh, in this system. So that's the side that we didn't want to mess up. <laughs> so I noticed that you were doing on the proxy the comparison of the responses. Yeah. Was there any a reason for you to do that in the proxy itself rather than set offsetting that somewhere else? Because I would assume that doing that in the proxy you increase your latency of the request. Uh, we yeah. So that was the so we. Yeah, you're right. Uh, so if you if you look at the, the code, I am doing it kind of asynchronously. So I only I only only do the comparison after after I finish serving the request, right? So it's after the uh, after the handler finishes. So the the diff is is in a in a go routine and it's on a wait group. So it waits until both of these finish. And so when this finishes, we finish serving the request, and then we do the we do the diffing asynchronously in the background of the running process. You're right, we could have just instead uh, the asynchronously just grow this to some sort of uh, stream processing system uh, or the responses together uh, and then do the diffing asynchronously. That, that works too. Uh, uh, we just chose to do it uh, on the fly. Uh, it, it, it kind of did the job, uh, job pretty well uh, without you know, having to set up all the, all the pipes for uh, publishing those events or and then sort of setting up the processor. Yeah, that, that would probably be a more scalable uh, or kind of probably error-prone, uh, no, less error-prone approach, potentially. 
uh, but yeah, it has other, other overheads. So if your you know, publishing breaks, then you are not seeing anything. So, uh, so yeah, but then we, yeah, we didn't, you do increase latency of the requests uh, because you need to buffer the, uh, buffer the requests when they come in uh, because you need to send them out to, to the two places. You actually don't need to do the, the copy of the response. You can, you can capture it as you are writing it through. Uh, so, so that way you, you won't really be uh, introducing much latency on that side. So the, the only thing you are you're slowing stuff down is, okay, well, it's, you're having an extra network hop, but that's generally pretty small. Um, and then you are having the, the, the buffering of the, of the request. So that's where you're slowing your system. But this uh, tends to be pretty negligible uh, in, in my experience or in our experience. It was yeah, nothing, sorry, nothing to be worried about. Thank you, Michal, for your presentation. Yeah, and a second round of applause for Michal.